So it's really a pleasure to uh, see all of you here today and to invite uh, uh, Dr. David Nash to join us um, here. Uh, we're up to the seventh annual um, Kohenka Lecture in Quality and, and Safety, and I, I just want to acknowledge our benefactor, Emmy Kohenka, who's in the, the third row here, and just thank her for the support. And, and uh, we, uh, we, really, we really do appreciate it, Ms. Kohenka. Um, Dr. Nash uh, is, uh, comes uh, um, after an illustrious line of speakers, and I, I just heard him speak early this morning, and I know he's not going to uh, uh, disappoint. He's uh, an internist who uh, is internationally recognized for his work in outcomes management, medical staff development, and uh, uh, quality uh, improvement areas. Uh, he's the founding dean um, of the um, uh, and a professor of health policy at the Jefferson School of Population Health. Uh, he comes from uh, undergraduate in Vassar. Uh, he uh, received his MD at Rochester, and he has an MBA from the Wharton School in, the, in Philadelphia. Um, his curriculum vitae uh, gives hernias and uh, is quite large and uh, uh, is really extremely uh, impressive. So uh, allow me to introduce Dr. David uh, Nash, who's going to talk on leadership for quality and safety. David, come on up. Okay. Let me get this to work. Well, good morning. Thanks very much, Stephen. We uh, really had fun this morning. Uh, so first, I want to thank uh, Helen Rank and her whole team. Could we have a round of applause for Helen? She's sitting right in the front row. So um, I had so much email with Helen, my wife Esther was beginning to wonder, who, who, who is that pretty blonde and what does she want? And I said, oh, honey, it's, it's all business related, not to worry. So uh, this is our secret. So anyway, really great to be here. What more could a guy like me want? A nice Friday morning, a packed house to talk about quality and safety, a wonderful donor who gets it. I mean, this is like it can't get any better than this. So truly a great pleasure for me to be here. Now, Helen has also worked me pretty hard so uh, we were up really early, and I met with a lot of the house officers as part of Journal Club, which was uh, actually a lot of fun. And then, uh, of course, we had our medical staff presentation. I have to say, most of them stayed awake the entire time, so that was awesome, too. Uh, but this is the highlight of the day. So once again, thank you so much for this beautiful invitation. So quality and safety, it's a pretty important topic. And what I'd like to do today is uh, uh, really divide my time with you into uh, three parts. Uh, first, I want to give you a little bit of uh, context and history and try to answer the question that I know my predecessors at this podium for this series have posed with you, which is uh, how do we get into this jam in the first place uh, and some definitions and basically to uh, set a level playing field so we're all talking about the same issue. So that's part one. Uh, then I'd like to use quality and safety as a springboard to talk about health reform, but not deal about the exchanges or any of that nonsense, but give you why quality and safety is central to making health reform work. Then I'm going to show you a picture of my family. That'll be my cue to talk about the future and I'm gonna give you some Nash's view of the future. So here are the three parts. Part one, how do we get in this jam and who cares? Part two, health reform like you've never seen it before. And part three, what does it all mean for the future? Sound reasonable? Okay, so before we get started, I, I brought some scholarly literature that I wanna share with you, namely the front page of USA Today. So um, here's a recent piece from just uh, almost exactly a year ago, cover story, what do surgeons leave behind? And they're not talking about like their wallet or their keys. They're talking about what they leave behind inside you and me when they're not supposed to. So that's important. Uh, the other cover story I thought was really kind of cool, also from USA Today just a couple of months ago, under the knife for nothing, meaning why do you have that procedure in the first damn place? And I have some other things too, but this was really to reinforce with you and me Front page stories all within the last couple of months. We have not licked the quality and safety problem. It's not always on the top of our mind necessarily, especially at a great place like HSS, 
but I'm here to tell you we have a lot of work to do. And believe me, if it's on the front page of uh, USA Today, the rest of the country is very interested as well. All right, well, I also want to thank Stephen for that very nice introduction, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the same spiel I gave the group this morning. So this is the floor of the gymnasium at Jefferson University in Philadelphia. I know whenever I'm here in the city, as I know you like to call it. <laughs> and Stephen, what you didn't tell them is that I grew up about 20 miles east of here in a little town called Merrick, Long Island, New York. Show of hands, who knows where Merrick is? All right, so that's very important. So also, I've worked assiduously to lose my New York accent, but when I come to a place like this, something happens, I don't know, and I revert back to where I was uh, a long time ago. So Jefferson, downtown Philadelphia, birthplace of our nation, home of America's first hospital, home of the American College of Physicians, the American Board of Internal Medicine, the National Board of Medical Examiners, four medical schools, 90 Joint Commission accredited hospitals. You get the idea. You may be the city, but we are the center of American medicine. We got that straight? Yes? Okay. Now we can be friends. All right. Finally, Jefferson. <laughs> so we don't have uh, uh, any pesky undergraduates, no business school, no law school. All we do is health care. And this is the uh, gymnasium of our undefeated basketball team, because we don't got one, and that's very important. <laughs> so I know I'm here in the most liberal city in America, and of course uh, I know we're in a very dark blue state, but whatever your politics, park it at the door. In part two, we're going to talk about health reform, and I just thought you'd enjoy this great picture of our president. So I think here he's a anesthesiologist is what I think this is. Look at the size of that syringe. And of course, this is going to hurt. You ain't seen nothing yet. We're going to come back to that in a moment. So I'm going to skip this next slide, too busy, because I wanted to really get into the weeds with you all in part one. And remember, this is why are we here and what's this all about for your wonderful quality day. So you could read along with me. All great, famous hospitals like Jefferson and HSS are accountable to the public for their degree of success. If this initiative isn't taken by everybody in this room, it will be taken by the lay public. And I could have written there, of course, Friday, January 24, 2014. But you'll note, if you have good eyesight, this is a direct citation from the inaugural meeting of the American College of Surgeons, no less, at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, not too far from here, during the First World War. Wow is right. So for a hundred years almost, we've been struggling with this issue. Now you're in year seven of this wonderful lectureship, but for a hundred years, our profession, and it's amazing to me as a primary care doctor that these are surgeons who were talking about this issue in 1918. That's an inside joke you should be laughing at. <laughs> But it is amazing that we've been contending with this issue for a century. Today, of course, it's front page news because of reform and we're spending 20 cents of every GDP dollar on health care. No other nation in the world even comes close. And many experts believe it's unsustainable. We'll come back to that when we talk about the future. But let's not kid ourselves. There ain't anything new under the sun, largely speaking. So any lecture on quality, we have to do a little bit of history to celebrate the day. And I couldn't think of two better people to help us celebrate than this guy, who, of course, you all know and love as the great-grandfather of our movement. This is the one and only Dr. Ernie Codman, C-O-D-M-A-N, Boston Brahmin surgeon practicing at man's best hospital on the banks of the Charles River at the turn of the previous century. And you all know Dr. Codman's story, I hope. He kept a record of every procedure he did on a file card. He called this the end result idea. He brought all his file cards to the Massachusetts Medical Society right around 1925 and said, gee, Let's publish my results 
so that every surgeon can benefit from the mistakes I have made. What was the reaction of the Massachusetts Medical Society to Ernie's breakthrough self-evaluation idea? Well, you know the history, of course. They banned Ernie for life from membership in the Massachusetts Medical Society. He died a pauper despite his family's wealth on the eve of the Second World War in 1940. So he's great-grandpa, and that's why we're here today. Here's grandpa. This is, of course, Dr. Avidus Donabedian, a Lebanese-American emigrated to the United States, speaking no English in his Lebanese Christian family. Came to the University of Michigan, where he spent 50 years as a faculty member and brought us what you and I know today as the quality tripod, structure, process, and outcome. The movement, great grandpa, grandpa, the movement has many new parents, some of whom have stood right here to deliver this amazing lecture to you. So this is the pedigree that we are all a part of, and that's important history for sure. Now, some not so good news in the front page story in Business Week magazine, now called Bloomberg Business, how appropriate here in New York City. But if you could read the headline, of course, medical guesswork from heart surgery to prostate care to spinal fusion, the medical industry knows little about which treatments really work. Now, this is a little disturbing maybe to non-clinicians in the room or certainly to any employer in the room, but it ought to be pretty disturbing to everybody, because what's the punchline? Regrettably, everywhere but Jefferson and HSS, <laughs> doctors don't always have the best available evidence with which to make important clinical decisions at the bedside, in the office, in the hospital, in the operating room. If you believe the experts, 20% of the time, we have the best available evidence. The other 80 plus percent of the time, we're practicing the art of medicine. The challenge with this is, of course, the art of medicine is complicated, expensive, and in many places, regrettably, colleagues, deadly. Deadly. Because medical error, in January of 2014, a century after those surgeons met at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, Medical error remains the fourth leading cause of death in our country. That's right, you heard me right. Fifteen years after the publication of Two Errors Human, which I'll show you in a moment. Well, there is some hope, even as we're learning this vocabulary together. Leaders like Don Berwick, way back in 1998, 16 years ago, said, it's possible to improve care and lower costs at the same time. And I know that your clinical leaders get this, and I know that you're working hard every day here at HSS to improve safety, to reduce unnecessary surgery, to reduce readmission, to coordinate care. So we're learning how to do this. Here's the Institute of Medicine list on exactly how to achieve a better outcome at a lower cost. And the list includes things that you're all a part of in this audience. Preventing medical error preventing avoidable hospital admissions, preventing avoidable readmission. I know many of you every day are working on making this place even more efficient, reducing the episode of care cost. We could spend the whole day drilling deep on this list, not my intent. My intent is to make sure we're on the same page that you agree. We can improve care and lower costs and deliver to the nation what she needs but it will require leadership. More on that at the end of our time together. So this is a wonderful slide that I stole from the president of Bay Care in Tampa, Florida. Here's a house officer, and he's poised between these two canoes. And this sort of summarizes where we're going and where we'll be in part three of our time together. So he could stay in this canoe, historical and current fee for service. The more we do, the more we get paid more fusions, more wrist surgery, you get the idea. And we could sail off happily into the future, but what he doesn't know is 200 yards downstream is a thousand foot waterfall because there's just no way the nation is going to tolerate ongoing. The more we do, the more we make, it just can't happen. We can't afford it. That's one choice. Second choice, of course, depending on how old he is, he could just dive into the drink and call it a day. 
And for many physicians of my age and over, they are hanging on by their fingertips, hoping to make it to retirement, pay off all those child uh, tuition bills, pay off the mortgage, and get out of here before it gets any worse. Or, or he could do what I hope we're all on the same page about. He could jump into this canoe and figure out how to move from a world of volume to a world of value, like we were talking about at Journal Club this morning. And the selection criteria for making sure we deliver value, for example, to that spinal fusion patient, that new knee patient, that new hip patient. And you as leaders, you're going to have to make this decision what you do. If you go back and look at the history of our movement that you are all a part of now, here's the 1991 definition of quality. I'm not going to read it to you, but it has, in my view, sort of three key messages. Message one, you got to worry about that population. Well, as Stephen noted, since I'm the dean of a school of population health, a corny term for sure, it's pretty exciting that this word is in the definition since 1991. The second thing it says is we got to ask patients what's important to them, their desired health outcome. So in 2002, I had a high-grade spondylolisthesis between L5 and S1 with crippling left sciatic pain. What was important to me was to get rid of that pain. I was ready to do almost anything. And that almost anything was to endure an L5-S1 spinal fusion surgery at our place done by my colleague and a person well known to all of you, Dr. Todd Albert. So my desired health outcome was not just to get pain free, I wanted to return to the tennis court and return to jogging. My neighbor in the bed next to me, a wonderful 72 year old from the suburbs of Philadelphia, his outcome, desired outcome was return to being able to do gardening in his backyard, being able to get up and down. Whose outcome is more important? Well, of course, a silly question. So we're going to have to find a way to measure this desired outcome. Not a trivial question. Number three, it says, consistent with current professional knowledge. Well, that means practice based on the best available evidence where it exists. So that's the definition we all ought to have as our platform. Here's a wonderful book that I know everybody in this audience has committed to memory. Let me just remind you, let me just remind you, 1999, September 1999. We've been at this game for at least 15 years. President Bill Clinton held this up in the White House. His exact words were, I commit my administration to reducing the epidemic of medical error. 15 years later, medical error is the fourth leading cause of death in our country. How could it still be true? And it is everywhere but HSS and Jefferson, for sure. Some of the components of this problem look like this. So here's AMA News story. Only 77% wash their hands after using the toilet. And they're not talking about kindergartners. They're talking about doctors attending an infectious disease conference. Can you believe it? So they had gender-appropriate medical students posted in the lavatories to do direct observation. Let me just leave this somewhat discomforting slide, and it's only 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> I want to thank all the ladies in the audience for raising the average to 77%. <laughs> An incredible challenge that we still face. Finally, just to round this out, my favorite ever Time Magazine cover story, what do doctors hate about hospitals? We don't have time this morning for me to do my Oprah thing and get in the audience and hug you and ask you what you think. But the reality is, what do doctors hate about hospitals? Front page Time Magazine story. Of course, you and I know the answer. Let's close the doors. Make sure no members of the public are here. The answer is, of course, being a patient in one, right? This is about eight physician families egregiously harmed from a preventable medical mistake, including Don Berwick's wife at Man's Best Hospital on the banks of the Charles River, where five Harvard neurologists couldn't figure out what was wrong with his wife. So this is still an important part of our business. Here's the other critical book you all remember. This is 2001, so this book is coming up on its bar mitzvah, a very important book. 
very important book that laid out these six domains, right, that we will commit to care that's safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, equitable, and efficient. Now, regrettably, colleagues, we don't have time today to go through all six of these and give you national examples, but you know in your heart and mind we have a long way to go, especially that patient-centeredness. My goodness, the last time you were a patient, what was it like? The last time your relative, your parent, was a patient. There are a lot of folks in this audience caring for elderly parents just like me, and I know how difficult this can be. So we are still on the journey to cross that quality chasm. The good news is we've got a lot of evidence today. You and I know exactly what we've got to do. We've got to wash our hands. We've got to close the feedback loop. We have to have good information delivered to doctors, nurses, pharmacists. We've got to promote teamwork. We have to listen to the youngest member of the team. Maybe they know something we don't know. We have a lifetime's worth of work together to still complete. Maybe that's the good news because it's a full employment act for everybody in the quality and safety business. Let me show you where we're going in the future, and I know some of you are already working on these issues. So from modern healthcare, these are some of the newer measures that we're going to be looking at, moving from process measures, did you order the test, to outcome measures. What happened after you got the data? Did you improve the patient's state? How about this? More focus on patient reported outcomes, like telling Todd Albert, I'm only going to do that fusion if I could return to the tennis court or return to jogging. You get the idea. We're going to be asking all kinds of newer, more complicated, deeper, more difficult to catalog kinds of questions. The measures that accompany that, hard to see in the back of the room, will include safety, care coordination, population health, the patient experience, cost and efficiency, again, a wonderful time to be in the business of measuring and improving what we do. A very exciting time for the world of quality and safety work. So what are some of the challenges that we're going to face still in part one together? Well, raise your hand if you've done this. You know, right. This is wonderful. This is from Harvard Business Review this past summer. I'm glad you appreciate it. So some of the challenges that our business faces before we get to health reform include stuff like this. So these are the two dreaded phrases that have derailed more quality work than anything I can think of. I once had a case. So in a great place like HSS in Jefferson, when a senior gray-haired or no-haired attending like Steve says, I once had a case, everybody listens, like E.F. Hutton. But the challenge is what? That's one case. Or when someone even more famous says in case after case after case that I have seen like this, well, from a population health perspective, that's an N of three. So in God we trust, all others bring their outcomes data. So this is a challenge deep in our culture. I once had a case, or especially at a leading place like this, when a senior attending says, in my experience, given the hierarchical nature of our training, we all will bow to the person with the greatest experience. It was evident at Journal Club this morning that this culture is alive and well. It's a part of the fabric of who we are and what we do. Another piece of this is the scientific evidence, which you and I know from people like Deming, Duran, Crosby, Schuhart, and an army of others. And the modern parents of the movement, Paul Batalden, Paul Plesic, Peter Pronovost, Robert Wachter, and a host of others, we've learned what? Well, it's expensive when you make a mistake. Not only is it harmful, but it's expensive. It's somewhere around 20 to 40 percent of every pre-tax revenue dollar. And we waste a lot of time and energy with this concept of work and rework. Let me give you a clinical example. So that work and rework, you know, when a patient gets transferred from some other hospital to Jefferson, what's the first thing we do? Of course, repeat every test. When a patient gets transferred from the University of Pennsylvania to Jefferson, we repeat every test twice just to make doubly sure our arch rival 20 blocks west of us. And I'm sure here at HSS you never repeat any MRI from anywhere else 
because only you know how good your team is. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody in the audience? No, I'm sure it does. So this is another part of our culture, another somewhat complex part of any training environment like here in Jefferson is deeply embedded in our clinical culture, nursing, pharmacy, it doesn't matter. See one, do one, teach one. Or sometimes at our place, I think it goes like this. See one, teach one, do one. But okay, <laughs> see one, do one, teach one. What's the problem with this? Of course, the problem is, hey, are you showing me the right way? Uh-oh. So in God we trust, all others bring their outcomes, not just what they think is right. And then finally, the research evidence points out pretty incontrovertibly, 85% of the time when there's a boo-boo, it's the process. 15% of the time, it's that schnook, we all know who she is. <laughs> but it's easy to blame the 15%. Why? There's the guilty party. I see her right here. Sorry, Helen, but you know what I mean. <laughs> it's easy to find the guilty party when you think of it from a non-system perspective it's much more complicated to ask the detailed question, how could we fix the system that's broken? Here's one way, and I'm not going to read you this laundry list, but oh boy, there's hard work to do in the office, in the hospital, in the operating room, wherever we are, there are systems and microsystems at work. You're familiar with this concept. We need a new generation trained in systems thinking this lectureship is an important step in that right direction. So part one, let's summarize. We're in a jam. Medical error is the fourth leading cause of death. We're spending 20 cents of every dollar on health care. The nation ranks number 17 after Slovenia with regard to the outcomes of care based on what we spend. Wow. So let's turn to part two and ask ourselves the question, is health reform going to push us in the right direction relative to the quality and safety question. So here's me at a recent medical staff meeting, and I'm boiling some bones here. Look at the size of these other doctors in our place. It's incredible. So this is, of course, the grounds for sculpture just outside Princeton, New Jersey. I hope you'll go and visit it. So let's talk about reform, because reform has, at its core, a population health truism. On your left is what makes us healthy as a population based on all global measures. So 50% of what makes us healthy is healthy behavior. Eating right, not smoking, wearing a helmet, driving at 55 miles an hour, exercising. The environment is 20%, not living in Beijing, China, where you can't breathe the air. Picking your parents wisely, that's an important piece. <laughs> and finally, and finally, according to the best available evidence, access to medical care, that's about 10 to 15 percent of the story. Paradoxically, in this great temple of technology, and where I hail from equally great, we together are 15 percent on a good day of what this story is all about. That's a incredibly powerful statement because on your right is the best research evidence we have where do we currently spend our money on health care it's upside down and backwards because we spend the vast majority of it on the actual laying on of hands when the real problem is those pesky social determinants of health poverty crime socioeconomic status education the environment access to food, you get the idea. All of these complex things in our heterogeneous, multicultural, vast geography nation, these are the core challenges of the future. So having said that, let's see what reform is really all about. Okay, given that this is a quality lecture, here's the punchline. Reform is all about building a new quality infrastructure on top of what we already got. Let me show you what I mean. And I have some pictures to help explain this. So reform builds on a quality infrastructure, has at least these five pillars. Pillar one is the National Quality Improvement Strategy. Maybe you've seen that. That's a 25-page document. That's it. From March of 2011, one year after reform was passed, it talks about 
how all the federal agencies are going to articulate to improve quality, AHRQ, CDC, FDA, CMS, HHS, you get the idea. Second pillar are new quality measures, and I know many of you are studying the scores of new measures coming our way. Pillar three, value-based purchasing, 10 cents of every Medicare dollar by 2017. 10 cents of every Medicare dollar by 2017 will be value-related, outcome-related. You're going to get paid if you get a good outcome. Pillar four, prevention and wellness. Well, hundreds of millions of new dollars going towards this. And pillar five, new entities and authorities, like the Center for Medicare Innovation, if there ever was an oxymoron, that yeah. is it. <laughs> but there's more. Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and many, many others. But this is really the key to part two. So here are the four underlying concepts of how we're going to try to tie quality to cost containment by changing how we're paid. I'm going to describe each box, then I'll show you a picture of each box. That'll be part two. So first, we're going to tie payment to evidence and outcome. Well, you're in good shape here at HSS. You have registries. You're keeping track of what it is you do. The vast majority of the nation is not yet ready to say, I've achieved a good outcome, therefore I deserve to be paid. This is moving from a world of volume, the more we do, the more we get paid no matter what, to a world of when you achieve an outcome, then we'll pay you. Oh, and if you mess up on that road to achieving an outcome, we may withhold payment, or worse yet, penalize you for getting that decubitus ulcer, for inducing sepsis, for inducing that uh, decubitus ulcer. You get the idea. Second box, we're going to bundle payment. So that's headed your way for sure, because all procedural specialties will lead the way here. One lump sum for that spinal fusion surgery, and you'll have to figure out how to divide it up between nursing, medicine, referring doctor, orthopedist, heat, light, and electricity. Here's the challenge with a bundled payment. Looking two, three years down the line for HSS and Jefferson, the total number of Medicare dollars is only going to go in one direction, down. So the size of that pie, we're going to slice up that pie. Here's the nursing piece, here's the pharmacy piece, here's the doctor piece, here's the hospital piece. As that pie shrinks, the slices are going to get smaller and smaller. And as that pie shrinks, colleagues, I'm worried table manners will deteriorate. <laughs> and we're going to fight over an ever-shrinking pile. So we have to figure out what's the value of the services we deliver. Maybe that care coordination is where we should spend the most money. And this is another, this is box three, being reimbursed to coordinate care. And finally, box four, you've all heard about accountable care organizations. I'll give you a picture of that in a moment. So as we move from left to right, organizations like HSS and Jefferson are going to bear greater economic risk. Today's not the day for the details, except to say a couple of things. So right now, I'm sure you're involved in a pay-for-performance contract. And this morning, we discussed those never events like wrong side orthopedic surgery and how dreadful that is. We're all working hard on this. That's pretty straightforward. Now we're moving into that bundled payment. Let me show you what's going on around the country in a minute. So bundled payments are really, really popular for procedurally based care, like hips and knees and lumbar fusion. Then we're going to have these medical homes. Perhaps you have a patient-centered medical home here at HSS. We have one at Jefferson we're very proud of. This medical home, as part of health reform, is going to promote the quality and safety agenda, right? Because we're going to move from a world that everything revolves around coming to see me for eight minutes as the primary care doctor to everything relies on the team, the doctor of nursing practice, the physician assistant, the pharmacist, the teamwork. That's a key piece of the future. Care is provided to those who only come in the front door. That's how we currently do things. Moving to a world where we're responsible for the population of patients and we're going to get paid in a totally different way. We'll come back to that. Take home message. The medical home is a big leadership challenge. Are we up for the challenge is the key question. 
Finally, you've heard about these accountable care organizations when we had the privilege of being here for your 150th birthday. Dr. Elliot Fisher, the father of the ACO movement, he and I shared this exact stage together in a wonderful morning last spring. It was a heck of a lot warmer that day. So do you know what ACO really stands for? Awesome Consulting Opportunity. <laughs> for big mouths like me and many others to come and badger you about where we're going. But colleagues, let me show you one ACO that Stephen didn't tell you about, and I think this is kind of cool. So um, I have the privilege of being a board member of a company I know you've heard of called Humana, headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. And I won't give you all the gory details, but here's a key message. This is our Humana commercial, Humana employees ACO in Louisville with our community hospital partner called Norton Healthcare, a four hospital system right across the street from Humana's headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky, home of the Kentucky Derby. And I want to read to you, right from a Humana briefing book, what the key attributes of this ACO are, and let you reflect on part one and part two of our time together. So the key attributes of this thing are as follows. An integrated care delivery model among provider teams. Wow. This does not say we only send doctors to the stars, patients to the stars, rather. It doesn't say that. Principle two, defined patient population to measure. Not just whoever walks in the door, but 28,000 Humana employees. That's the population in this case. And number three, pay for results based on improved outcomes and cost. Wow. That's the future. And guess what? This is happening right now in Louisville, Kentucky, of all places. So here's my question as we leave part two. Are you ready to take these three core principles to heart here at HSS? That's my question to end part two. Okay. Let's go to part three, the final part of our time together to try to stay on schedule. So I really like Malcolm Gladwell. If you've ever seen him in person, he's quite a character. He's a real beanstalk, over six feet tall, has a huge haircut, bounces around, pretty wild. Anyway, this is his best book, I think, his first book, The Tipping Point. So here's my question to set up the last part of our time together. Are we at the tipping point for reform to really change what you and I do every day? I don't know. I, I think about this a lot. I'm sure you do, too. So let's go to part three. Let me give you some summary stuff to take home and give you a glimpse into Nash's view of where the future is going. So uh, here's the team I promised I would show you. So uh, this is at Thanksgiving at my brother's house in Scarsdale. This is uh, the boss. Uh, she's a uh, managed care executive. These are my fraternal twin daughters. So this is Esther, Leah, Jacob, Rachel, and David. We got the entire Old Testament pinned down right here. <laughs> And we've turned into a medical family, of course. The two of us met in medical school, so that got the ball rolling. Rachel's a senior medical student at GW, today on her last of her senior year interviews going into medicine. Her fraternal twin sister, Leah Nash, is working inside the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. So I have a daughter inside the belly of the beast. Pretty cool. <laughs> And as I said earlier today, I'm so grateful that my son Jacob, who has been unemployed since graduation, <laughs> finally got a job, which is pretty good because he was running out of cash. And I don't know what he was going to do living in Denver, but uh, thank goodness, a day before his 23rd birthday, he finally got a job. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> so let's talk about the future. Let's talk about the future. So um, is this the future? Is this the future? Yeah, I don't know. This is my Wharton classmate, the other handsome guy in this picture. He needs no introduction. Why? Well, because Mehmet, first of all, an amazing classmate, super smart, whatever you believe about his current shtick, he's an incredibly smart character. 
So let me tell you a quick story about the future. So this is Mehmet giving me an award that he had previously won a year ago. Details not important. Here's the take-home story. Having achieved this Wharton Award, leaving New York City on a train southbound to Philadelphia late at night, after midnight, on a weeknight, my iPhone is exploding. And I'm wondering, what, who is even awake at this hour? So here's the take-home. Mehmet's Twitter feed, which goes to 1.2 million people who apparently have nothing to better to do on a weeknight, <laughs> were communicating his people had put this picture on his Twitter feed, and so I was getting email and phone calls that went something like this. Is that you? <laughs> Meaning, how did my face end up with him? So what's the message for part three? Ah, so the message is this. Let's go back. The message is this. Do you think that these three will sit still for the kind of nonsense that you and I have tolerated as patients our whole life? What do you think the answer to that question is? Leah Nash is going to want that care when she wants it, at the price she wants. You better be online. You better be able to do email. And if the background color to your Facebook page isn't pleasing to her, she'll go elsewhere. <laughs> that, that is the patient of the future. The final challenge is him. <laughs> Wait. Here's why. Colleagues, and if you have sons of this age, <laughs> there is no known unit of time short enough to measure his attention span. <laughs> and he'd like to be a patient at HSS. What are you going to do for him? Go here. No, no, no. That clinic's only open at such and such a day. No weekend hours. No nighttime hours. Are you kidding? <laughs> he'll go elsewhere. No matter how great you think you are, he'll go elsewhere. And by the way, all the data will be online available for all three of these cats to evaluate 24-7. That's the future vision. So let's get back to summary. So here is the president of your medical staff. <laughs> Otherwise, a very nice guy. And here's where we're headed in the future. So let me give you kind of Nash's summary. So what does all this mean? Well, first of all, again, what a great privilege to be up here at this awesome place on a Friday, knowing all the people who preceded me and who will no doubt come after me. It's humbling. Truly, it is. So the take-home message is the major themes moving forward. It's all about transparency and accountability. If transparency and accountability worry you, uh-oh, then you ought to be worried. If you're worried about a report card, then you ought to be really worried. That's the take-home message. And I can summarize all of health reform from part two in four words. All you got to remember, colleagues, is no outcome, no income. That's where we're headed. Even at a great place like HSS, you're going to have to be tracking this just like everybody else. Now, as a leader, I would urge you to embrace this message of measurement and improvement because you ought to be defining what the outcome means at every stage, every level, every type of patient. That's what a world-famous, world-class place is all about. You've got this opportunity. I recommend you grab it by the horns. How might we achieve this? Well, it's a laudable goal. This is just a few things. We won't read all of these. Practice based on the evidence. Reduce variation. Engage with Jacob, Leah, and Rachel across the continuum of care. The good news is we got a lifetime's worth of work to do here, and I know that you're up to the challenge. So let me leave you with a couple of closing thoughts and end right on time. So at our School of Population Health, two minutes of selfless advertising, I hope you'll come and join us all online in our program in healthcare quality and safety, our special program on quality and safety management, largely for clinicians, our online program in health policy. We have certificates available in all of this at the graduate level. I hope you'll come and talk to me in private. If one other thing comes out of today where I can recruit one or two devoted students to come and help us on the journey, gosh, that would be an 
awesome outcome for me, in addition to all the fun we've had already today. So let me lead you then with a few fun things about the future. Uh, so here I am, occupying Wall Street. <laughs> Remember that movement. If you've ever been to the floor of the stock exchange, it's actually uh, really quiet. It's basically a global financial television station. And this phone doesn't even work, but it makes for a great picture. So let me leave you with a couple of things. And uh, we're going to poke back inside Humana for a moment. And I'm going to share a Humana secret with you, so I hope you won't tell anybody. And I hope you won't put this on YouTube or elsewhere, because I'll be in a heap of trouble. But I'm going to show you a slide from our Christmas board meeting, and here it is. So this is what we call medical management of members across a continuum. A lot of jargon. Here's the message. Of our 11 million customers nationwide, 5% of them drive 41% of the total cost that Humana spends on health care. That's right. 5% drives 41% of the total cost. So here's the question to conclude. What are we going to do about that 5%? And the answer is, we're going to manage every aspect of these patients' care. Let me give you some examples. We're going to send nurses to check on their medication at home. We're going to send aides to make sure that shag rug at my mother's home in Boynton Beach, Florida, is out of the slippery bathroom floor. We're going to take my mother in a van, a Humana van, to her doctor visit to make sure she shows up. When she gets into the hospital, we're going to coordinate every aspect of her care. You get where I'm going with this, right? So it's all about care coordination, measurement, population-based activities to change the very model of how care is going to be practiced in the future. And the core goal... The core goal, the message you may not like, the core goal of this 5% is what? Keep them out of the hospital for special surgery and Jefferson at all costs. That's the model moving forward. So you and I put my Jefferson hat back on. We got a big challenge. Where are we in the scheme of things here in the future? That is an important question. So let me leave you with special permission Stephen gave me to show this slide. Now, I won't read it out loud because we have a lot of sensitive people in the audience. But let me leave you with a quick summary. Let me leave you with a quick summary. So in part one, we talked about how do we get in this jam? 20 cents of every dollar our nation spends. If we keep it up, there'll be no roads. There'll be no schools. There'll be no defense. It'll all be a gigantic hospital, which is clearly not tenable. In part two, we tried to connect the dots between reform from a quality and safety perspective and how that'll drive a no-outcome, no-income world. And then in part three, we talked a little bit about those 26-year-old girls. So in nine years, 35 years old, the archetypical female, head of household, 35-year-old, middle-class woman who makes every healthcare decision in our country they're going to not sit still for the kind of care, the less efficient, lack of patient-centeredness. They're a new consumer headed our way. Are we ready? So let me close the way I started. I want to say thanks so much, everybody. It's a thrill for me to be here. I want to congratulate you on your Quality and Safety Day, and I look forward to the ceremony. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.